this is lecture number two. Uh, and those of you who were here yesterday, I welcome you back. Those of you who came today for the first time, I welcome you as well. So both are welcome. And today is going to be a little more technical. So if you recall, yesterday I dropped many, many new concepts, new ideas, new words. And I also promised that tomorrow, meaning today, I'm going to take those concepts down, two, three levels down, so that you get a good foundational knowledge of the key concepts behind the blockchain platform, basically. So today's goal is basically day two, lecture two, the technology foundations. What are the technological foundations behind blockchain? So give you some example, cryptography. Cryptography is very critical and key foundation in the blockchain platform. Without that, we can't imagine blockchain. Second concept I, I referred yesterday, I talked about briefly was trustless consensus. Trustless consensus. As a reminder, trustless does not mean there's no trust. Trustless means it is trusted by design. So trust is built in by design itself. That's what it means. And the other one was proof of what? POW. And then the other thing called proof of stake. So we'll talk about those things or proof of everything, basically. So they are the key concepts. Uh, you have to have a proof that someone has done something, has solved a puzzle, proof for that. There are many different ways to have the proof. There's not only one way. But POW, proof of work was the first one. This came with the Bitcoin application. And cryptography and trustless consensus. So today we are going to dive even deeper than yesterday and we'll get more meaningful of idea about what this list is all about. Very good. This is just a repeat of lecture two. Uh, the basis of blockchain is what is called a hash function. And what hash function does, it takes any string of any length as input. You can take your name, my name, you can take one or zero or A or B, or you can take all the library books of IIT Gandhi Nagar or any library in the whole world, or all libraries <coughs> combined, you can take the whole volume of data or information as input and produce it a fixed size output. Very important concept. The input can be any length, any size, to a hash function, and the output will be always a fixed size output. Please remember that. And Number three is efficiently computable. Because if you can't compute a hash function, then you can't use it. And either now or when you go back to your dorm, hostel, you can take your smartphone, go to Google, and say, type your name or uh, uh, Google, Google for a uh, hash calculator. And then it calculator will come there, type your name or anything you want to type, you will get a hash output this weekend. And that hash output is unique. It's like a finger fingerprint this weekend. So if you look at from a systematic point of view, as an engineer, the block the hash function called h of x, x of any size is input, and the output is y with fixed size all the time every time. So that's the basic we have the basic features of a hash function. And a proof of work, I mentioned earlier, is a tool to reach a trustless consensus. If there is no proof of work, then you cannot reach a trustless consensus. Because there will be contention. He will claim that he did the work. He will claim he did the work. She will claim she did the work. In a decentralized system, there is no central authority. So it has to be very, very clear cut who did the work, who solved the puzzle, who solved the cryptographic <coughs> puzzle. And that's why the, it is, the proof of work is an essential element to establish 
Do you want out or trust in the system? That is the basic definition or basic way to look at hash algorithms or hash functions and what is a proof of work. Any questions by the way so far? Please. Hash is invertible. I mean, can I have hash and I can produce the data back? Okay. That's a very good question. I have just wait for a couple of more slides and then we will, we will come to that <coughs> as well. Now, some more detail about cryptographic hash function. There are three basic criteria for hash function. And you might get to answer on your own by the way. Uh, number one, a, a hash function has to be collision free. And I will explain to you what, what is the meaning of collision free. If you look at this side here, on your right hand side, Collision free means if and when x and y are different, different input. x is another one input, y is another input. So if and when x and y are different from each other, then no one can find hash of x same as hash of y. Because if given two inputs, if you get the same hash function, if two human beings have the same fingerprint, can you imagine what will happen? Then we will not use fingerprint as a as a as a tool, right? Same thing here. But the key word I want to add from a learning point of view is no one can find. That's the very key word. That is that hash of x and hash of y, even though x and y are different, there is a one in a zillions or trillions possibility that h of x will be same as h of y. But the probability is so low that you can't find it. So just remember, you are an engineer, you are young, your mind is open right now. The key term here is no one can find. So it doesn't mean that h of x cannot equal h of y, it can. But probability is so low that for all practical purposes you can't find. And that's called collision free. Remember that. It's very, very important idea behind hash function. So you can think about now, last the question. Once we go back, what will happen? And the answer will be will, will, will get the answer. Hiding. The second property of, of hash function, of cryptographic security hash function, is hiding. Meaning that when a secret value, a secret number, secret data, value R, let's call it R, is chosen from a probability distribution with a high entropy. With a probability distribution function which is high entropy disorder and that is appended or concatenated to x is input. So you choose r which is highly probabilistic and concatenated with x the input then the hash of r x is such that no one can find x. So you are hiding the input basically. You are hiding the input x so that you know the edge of x and you have concatenated x with r other secret code value then it is impossible to find x so this also means by the way if there is no r then you should be able to go back just answer so, so in, in cryptographic hash functions you always concatenate the input and i will, I will, I will you will understand when I talk about the block structure, I showed yesterday, there's something called nonce, they know MCE. So you will see how that whole thing works out now. These are the basic fundamental concepts here. Hiding. So you have to hide X. How do you hide X? By combining that, concatenating that with other probabilistic function, which is random, totally random. 
So that is making life difficult for people to find X. And third one, it should be puzzle friendly. <coughs> so that hiding shouldn't be that difficult, so you can't solve the puzzle. So you have to solve the puzzle because otherwise you can't add a block, right? So puzzle solving is the method to, to use as a proof of work. So if you can't solve the puzzle, there's no proof of work. That means that you can't add the block in the chain. Any questions, guys? Is it becoming clear? Is time also an input? Okay. So each block which I did is time stamped. So it is not an explicit input, but as the chain gets formed or becomes longer, each block is time stamped. Basically. So time is a factor of not explicit input to this to this uh, model. So I hope this is clear, guys. Uh, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, puzzle friendly would mean uh, more the complexity of the puzzle, more the reward we get. Or you will get the reward to solve the puzzle. So, but the first one is supposed to solve the puzzle, you get the reward. The reward is almost the same all the time, basically. It's a platform decides that you get one Bitcoin or two Bitcoins, or you get one Ether, or point zero 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 two five Ethers. Right? Because they are fractional of two, right? It's not one, you can go down to, yeah. So, you can see the puzzle, all predictability and randomness. So like any puzzle, or all puzzles, depend upon unpredictability and randomness. Although it's not a puzzle, right? Instead it says all you know it, right? So, so that's what it is. There are three, three qualities or three criteria or three features of a hash function to be usable in the blockchain platform or model, okay? So I'm going to go to the next slide and see that it will be clear to all of you. So let's apply those things now slowly. Let's go slowly a little bit deeper and deeper. So what does blockchain use by the way? Blockchain uses something called SHA. They also call it SHA. SHA 256 hash function. The 256 bits basically, from a hashing point of view, it's a 256 bits. And it's a decimal notation around 64 nibbles. So if you look at the data, my first name Kamalesh, and second block, you get Dvivedi, my last name, and, and the third block is say EZXCIO. And if you look at the hashes of each of them, they're all unique. And you can use your smartphone and type Kamalesh, you will see that you get the same thing again. You will not get a different hash. You will get the same hash function if my name is typed the way it is typed here. Uppercase, lowercase, they both have meaning. So you can see the first one is uppercase. If I type all uppercases, then it's different hash function. Okay? And you can try get or use your own name or IIT Gandhi Nagar, you can do all kinds of stuff, right? So if you look at this one here, SHA stands for Secure <coughs> Hash Algorithm and it's a cryptographic mathematical function designed by the US National Security Agency, NSA. In 2003, 2004 time frame, NSA made their this public. And that's what that's the origin of that. And SHA 256 produces a 256 bit hash and 64 nibbles in a hexadecimal notation. Those of you who don't know what hexadecimal notation is, I don't want to go into detail now because there are lots of things to, to cover. Please Google or ask your computer science friends uh, who know what, what that is by the way. But I assume that all of you know some, something about that. So, the structure of a block. Yesterday, I gave you a very brief introduction to how a block looks like, right? And if you recall, there's a block ID number, a nonce, you know, NCE, data, a data can be, again, one letter on whole world's library, everything the see. Whole universe can be there, basically. Then hash, hash had two of them, previous hash, 
and the and the current hash, right? Genesis block has no previous hash, but block one, block two, all of them have previous hashes and their own hashes, basically. So I, for simplicity, I'm not showing the previous here or the current one, just showing the hash. Okay? But I made a note here so that you guys can remember from yesterday there are two of them, previous and current. And now a new word I'm introducing today called mine. Like mining. Not mine like mine, like me mine. It's like mining. So I'm going to talk about that in today as well. What mining is, why mining is done. You may have heard about Bitcoin mining or, or some so you will hear about that. So there are five elements. You look at ID, nonce, data, hash, and mine. I said yesterday with previous uh, uh, hash and current hash are five elements. So I've combined the two hashes into one. And counting mining or mine is also one of the elements, basically. Sorry, please go ahead. So NONC is a word that is not used once, okay? Or used only once. Used only once, I think. Not in, so nonce is used only once. And 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 so so that's what meaning is and why they name that nonce, you know, because that's a very unique number and you will hear when we talk about the leading zeros, you know, we talk about leading zeros, you will hear why nonce has to be only used only once, basically. So, so, if there are some platforms, uh, blockchain platforms, which execute contracts, so all the data of the contract would be in the data part? Correct. 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 The data is not only numbers, data is like information. So, so look at it here now. Time stamp connected series of blocks make a blockchain. We talked about time earlier, that's where time comes here. So first block, the Genesis block, it has no previous hash. It's blank here, you can see that. And data is using again the same kind of thing, so you guys can really you can drill down the idea. So Kamal hash has a unique hash. And now you will see that these hashes I'm talking about have four leading zeros, which I did not show that earlier. I just hashed it, and it's okay. That's the hash comes to see that. So when you use my name in uppercase, you will not get zeros. You will get without non-zero hashes basically. You won't get four digit zeros. So if you look at number block two, block three, block four, Kamlesh Dvivedi is an XCIO. Now he does nothing. All the hashes are different. So what does mining do and what does nonce do? So from a puzzle solving point of view, I'll make it very simple for you to understand. You, the challenge is to find a number here which, uh, which <coughs> attaches four leading zeros. And there's no sanctity about it. You can have a other cryptographic method. You can say, I don't want leading zeros, I want trailing zeros. I want you in the middle, <laughs> right? So, but that's how that's how the whole thing you know got designed at the beginning. So these four leading zeros are here. I'm showing five, which can be six, can be seven, can be eight. And I will let you ask you think tonight. What happens if you increase the number of leading zeros? Does it make it more secure or less secure? Does it make it more Puzzle friendly or less puzzle friendly? You are smart people, IIT people, right? So I'm just throwing this stuff so that you can you can question, raise questions yourself, and find answers of yourself when I'm gone back. So I'm showing five here. You can say have eight, you can have nine, you can show whatever you want to do, but you want to be consistent. You can't have five in one and two in one. So nonce is the number. The puzzle solvers or the miners, they're called miners, are trying to find a number there which adds the, the leading zeros or trailing zeros and the number of zeros you want to see that. That's what the nonce is. And one nonce will produce one result. So you can't have one nonce having 
more than one kind of hash we see. It's clear? Please speak louder so that they can hear it. These four zeros are the output we get when this nonce is given to a hash node. So, so, okay, so a data of course the beginning has a hash, and that hash doesn't have necessarily any zero. Necessarily, but it may not have, right? So, challenge is to keep changing this number because you can't change the data. Data is a, a sacred, holy, damper proof information you want to store there, right? So, only this is given intentionally in the hands of miners to, to find a hash of the whole thing which has x n number of zeros leading or training or how you decide to do this okay how does, how does non spell it sorry how does non spell it uh, i don't understand the question sorry how does non spell it <coughs> okay so what happens so this hash this hash is the hash of everything before that in a block so if you change anything here the hash will change so think about the compute power required to, and how many iterations computer has to do to, to change this to land up in a number of zeros. Many iterations. Manually you can't do that by the way. So it is actually the non plus data hash yeah. which, should, which should have been everything below this if you look at block number two, it's also the previous hash as well. <laughs> It doesn't understand. We are talking about cryptographically secure systems. It has to be bulletproof. No, no ifs and then. Sorry. Nonce also unique. You need to produce the the result. The result to append the to append the form. Same nonce can be used in some other block. Uh, I would say no. So nonce are. Because the data is different, so the probability of probability of having the same nonce is, is is so low that that I would say no. no. Okay. So every time the new hash is repeated, it is based on the previous hash data as nonce. Correct. 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 And also, by the way, but every time the nonce will be different. Should be different. Should be different. At least as, as far as we can know. Then why we are considering the previous H2? Why? Ah. Why we are considering the previous H2? Why are you considering the previous H2? Good question. A great question. And I mentioned yesterday the previous hash is a cryptographic link in the whole chain. So that if you, let's say, example, the way they become Pande, I believe the same name I used yesterday. The way they become Pande, this will change. So now this is appearing here as previous hash. This will change. Guess what? This will change. This will change. So every succeeding hash in every block will be changed. But changing the way to Pande. But we will to to debate it, let us say. Make it more humor, right? This is the data is changed, then the all the hashes will be succeeding. Yeah. Succeeding, okay. So if you look at from a security point of view, one of the promise of blockchain technology is tamper proofing of everything, right? As I mentioned yesterday. From a security point of view, think about how much pain in, excuse me, sir. Sorry, I'm asking this, this question. So sorry. So we can, we can, the pain, the pain if all the succeeding blocks has a change, then imagine the pain of the compute power, the personal pain required to calculate all those blocks again. That's not impossible, but very life threatening basically. It takes a long time, lots of power, lots of public power. Okay, so so that's the that's the. I hope it is clear to you, right? Okay, that's the part of the beauty of the whole thing. Not beauty, the the, the promise of the blockchain, right? So you need to change, then you don't want blockchain. Just have Oracle database or whatever database, SQL Server, or whatever you want to do. Now, 
That is the previous thing about hash functions, cryptography, how the blocks are linked to each other, okay? And how difficult it is to change any data or tamper any, anything there because it pins the net. It requires lots of money and energy to solve the puzzles again for every block. But if you have only one block, life is easy, right? But you want to use blocks for one block because that's useless. It's a, it's a waste of time and money. What, what person or yes, is this hash code is uh, accessible by all? Yeah, yeah. If you want, you can. I said, take a smartphone, type your name, look for hash calculator, and you get a hash function. I put it now in the platform to come to the platform. No, I'm asking the network. I think for the whole network, I'm asking, what are the hash function that is. Use in this network. Can I access that? Yes. Any cryptography system, uh, hash functions are available for everyone. Okay. So thank you for helping me out. <laughs> Good. Okay. But usually with the platforms on blockchain, all those things come with that platform. You don't have to start from scratch. As a developer of application, I. You know, I can't even know why you want access to the hash. I don't know. Okay, so that's about hash and hash algorithm. The three features, you know, puzzle friendliness, hiding, and, and uniqueness, all those things, right? We, we go through that. I give an example of how they're connected to the, to the uh, algorithms and hashes. Now, we know the role of cryptography to some extent, as previous slide, right? Why is proof of work required? Why POW is required? You've got to understand that really well. Really well. Every blockchain application will depend upon the T concept. Proof of work, proof of stake, proof of something else. Okay? So, proof of work is required to establish a trustless consensus. In a decentralized network, a global network, where no one is controlling anything, you need some automatic, automated algorithm, a method to establish the trust. Who did what on the network? Because so there's no master, no malik, no controller, nothing at all. So proof of work is required to enable a trustless consensus. If you don't need, in reverse of that, if you don't need a trustless consensus, then you don't need to your government. I give an example. You can ask you, what is the situation? Don't need a, a trustless consensus. Example. Suppose IIT Gandhi Nagar designs an application, just private blockchain, a private chain called IIT Gandhi Nagar chain. And that is only for its own small little application to do something. Okay? And there's no trust required there because people who are accessing the system or they're part of the network, they're all trusted by, you know, we all know that. Ganesh, Ganesh, Suresh, Praveen, everyone, right? So don't, then you don't need a POW. You don't need to waste compute power by embedding, by designing POW algorithm in your application. You don't need that. You can still have the cryptographic security as we talked earlier today, but you don't need a POW if the trustless is not required. Okay? Make it very, very clear. So, a real life example. Here is a person, a lady, is showing a bill, it's a $20 US bill, US dollar bill, and look at how it goes. People, we don't partition the thought process, we take it for granted. Someone gives me a 1,000 rupees note, you know that's one thousand rupees no. But look at the brain waves. So what is happening in the brains of both sides? The giver and the taker. This person says, I know it's a control bill. They know that's a control bill, right? Then those group of people there, they're also holding a twenty-dollar bill in their hand. They are saying, we know it's a twenty-dollar bill. Then look at this party, the left party here, right? I know that you know it's a total bill. Because if you don't, do not know total bill, guess what? You don't accept it. 
I can tell you that, oh, here's a thousand rupee bill, for example. And he said, no, I don't know. Right? Then those guys also, we know that you know, think about it. That's part of the process goes. Remember the mango tree example I gave yesterday? One guy says it's mango tree. Other guy says mango tree. Oh, mango tree. Other say, no, it's not a mango tree. But guess who wins? Three people can win against one person. So here, that 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 trustless that the trust is established by the knowledge from both sides and the acknowledgement of the knowledge. So I know is not enough. You have to know. That is also not enough. I have to know that you know. Not enough. You have to know that I know. <laughs> so think about this very, very fundamental thing, guys, okay? In real life, we don't think about it. We go for a coffee as well. Take rupiah, pass rupiah, no, right? But guess what? The guy has to know his pass rupiah. Otherwise, he says, go in. So this is very, very, this is the process of real life consensus building. That's what goes in your mind when we transact with anyone. Anyone else other than ourselves. I'm sorry, it's very obvious to many of you, but this process has to be talked about today so people understand how consensus is built, how trust is built around anything in your life. Once you get that in your head, then the other thing will be very easy to understand. Now, one who has the proof of work gets to add the next block in blockchain. So the benefit, sorry I just need so much, I think I'm talking too much. <laughs> so, the benefit, yeah, we have talked about PPOW and blockchains and uh, adding a block for the stuff, right? So, just look at the, on your, on your right hand side, there is a global network of miners, could be bigger computers, computer power, or access to the computer power. There are people who don't have uh, big machines, they are light, light kind of folks, they are shown like, like this here. Uh, then Bitcoin, let's say Bitcoin the application as an example. It can be any application, right? So, think about it. It's a decentralized network. Sometimes many people might try to add a block. I solved the puzzle. You say, I solved the puzzle. I solved the puzzle. Now, all of them can't be allowed to add a block at the same time. Because of the disorder, chaos, and all. High entropy situation. Uh, totally out of control. So, how do we decide who has the next block in a decentralized, trustless world? That's where the guy who are the first one to publicize, advertise the whole network. That, Hello, I saw the puzzle. So all those miners, all those guys, and they will also oh yeah. Oh, I found it. I, I confirmed that he solved the puzzle. So the competition basically to the miners with the big access to big compute power. So those guys are competing like a like a kite flying that day, real competition, right? <laughs> so they're competing that to confirm that Ramesh or Suresh has solved the puzzle. And he gets the Bitcoin for the, uh, the award for that. Can be Bitcoin, can be Ether, can be whatever, right? Or rupees coin. So that's how the things work basically. And again, trustless consensus, if it's not required, we don't need pure double. I will emphasize that again. Please, sir. I'm sorry to ask this. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. We are here to learn. What kind of puzzle are you talking about? What kind of puzzle are you talking about? Okay, so let's go back. The So if we go back here. So puzzle was, okay, so let's understand this one first. Let's, let's go back here. There are three features of the cryptographic hash function. It has to be collision free, hiding, and puzzle friendly. I don't want to talk detail now because I will talk about that. And if you look at this one here, the norms have to be found which leads to a specified 
type of hash. And the specified type of hash can be some numbers within the zero or can be zero or how one to want to, to, to design the puzzle. So this puzzle design that I want five zeros before every hash function. So a nonce, a nonce has to be found to, to, to give birth to the hash function with that that specified number of zero. That's the problem. Is it clear? No. Okay. So, 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 go ahead. So, finding the, finding such a norm would be the puzzle. Exactly. Yeah. Finding the hash with the required number of leading or zeros is the puzzle. Nonce is the tool because you can't check the data. So, so nonce is the tool to help you to find the hash which has been zero. So we can't say that nonce is the puzzle, nonce is the tool. Get it? And who generates it? Uh, nonce. I'm sorry? Who generates the unique nonce? Okay. So, look, okay, so the, that's a, a structure of the block itself. The miners, miners will be finding that. <coughs> Starting from one, two, three, four, one thousand. So miners are the ones who are going to crack the code, so to speak. Okay? And that's where the 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 the, 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 the award, the award comes to that, to that miner. To solve the puzzle. So, just one second. So if you look at this 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 network, the miners with access to the compute power. They are the guy, one of them, to solve the puzzle and then tell everyone that, hello, I saw the puzzle. Then other guys will try to verify that and perform that he did it. And you can tell you that. Sorry, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, changing the moments, uh, number by number, it is like similar to a brute force. Uh, yes, it's a brute compute force. So I don't say brute force, it's compute force. Right? Is it true that uh, every time the miner with the highest computing power would be able to solve? Usually you can conclude that way. Is there a possibility that two miners at the same time may find a puzzle? That is going to be difficult, hard. If, like if the nanosecond or microsecond level. Uh, it is but, possible. But in the network, like, there is a the possibility, like, if I'm not trying to. It is possible. Some person will come to know that I have done the puzzle while the other will come to know that the other person has done the puzzle. So then how will we? Good question, by the way. It is possible that finding can collide, but the probability of that is very, very low. So I have to avoid this. Mostly the, uh, people try to form pools and uh, they increase their power more than the other tools and try to overcome these. So I don't want to name Chinese people and China as a country, <laughs> but uh, you can Google through. There are countries in the world, I don't want to say what country, or they have said it anyway. <laughs> they have formed such full value. They are, they, are, they are collaborating with each other to get the, to capture the, the Bitcoin. They are. They have become a big business. But this scenario can create a problem. Yeah, and that's, a, that's one of the problems now. Is, People can collude together as a group to to basically fuzz the system, so to speak, for their benefit. Again, for every good thing in the world, we have some bad people. <laughs> There's some bad bad things happening, but let's focus on the good right now. Okay. <laughs> but good good point, by the way. Really good point. I don't expect you guys to form a collusion, okay? <laughs> so be honest and <laughs> so. Now, I talked about generative proof of work, how hard, how easy it is. It is very, very hard. Here's a graph, basically, of what is called Poisson CDF, cumulative distributed function. Those of you who did your math or stats, you will know what that is by the way. I forgot my fundas, my decanto. I forgot all of that. But at my younger age, we studied that as well. So on the x-axis, you have time, seconds, I actually have a probability. So look at how this distribution function goes, right? To have 90% certainty, 
look at the how, how far you have to go here, how many seconds it takes. In computer world, seconds is not the thing you want, right? You agree or disagree? Okay. So you can see the asymptotic kind of nature of this distribution function. So if you look at it, it's a very random process. You know the R, the hiding thing we talked about earlier? So if you concatenate R, which is derived from a highly probabilistic function like this, with X, the input, guess what? The hash function output, not can predict. That's what it is. So proof of Bitcoin uses a proof POW called hash cash. And those of you, well, you all get a young woman to remember that, but in the early days of email, I know today, a spam scum, right? There are spam companies, they send a spam. It's not a spam for them, it's spam for us, right? <laughs> you get the receiving end, right? Hash cash was the method, algorithm designed to make the spammers life more difficult. So they have to make more effort to send those a spam. From our point of view, not from their point of view. Their point of view is a market, right? So, hash cash is the algorithm and the proof of work used by this one. It does not mean that there's the only, only algorithm by this for POW. That's what Bitcoin uses. For your applications, you can have your own unique kind of algorithm for POW. The proof of work, I already have talked about it. The proof of work is required only when you want to establish a trustless environment, trustless consensus. You don't need that if the trust is only there. And there are two people using an application, guess what? You don't need any, any trustless consensus. Now, the structure of the proof of work. We already talked about that. I expanded the hash with the four, the, the four living zeros. There are 64 nibbles, basically. Mm -hmm. So a non satiri found, we see the data for this example I'm giving, for this data here, plus the ID, plus the nonce, plus the previous hash. Previous hash is not shown here, mm -hmm. but it is there, okay? Then minor will find a number which will give me a, not this hash, but something like this. Clear? There are 64 nibbles in hexadecimal representation. Got it? Now, example of the proof of work. If there's no example, you say, what is this? Think about it. I use the American names, Sally and Jim. Sally creates a Bitcoin wallet, made a wallet in the virtual currency world. So that wallet has an ID number, which is owned by Sally. So, Sally gives her public key, so public key and private key. One is a kind of username equivalent, one is a password equivalent. So, if you send an email to me, I give my username to you. Congress, DVD, MSN.com, whatever. Right? So, Sally gives Jim her username, the public key. Jim opens his wallet. Not opens physically, but the public wall, and sends one Bitcoin to Sally's public key by sending an email. You got my mail address, send an email to me. And I think parallel so you can simply understand the concept, right? Then Sally now has one Bitcoin in her wallet because Jim sends to her public address, the public key. So number two. So so Jim gives send. Sally, one Bitcoin. So you can understand how these transactions are happening in the cryptocurrency world, okay? So, now that transaction will be having a block and not by itself. So there are many transactions get collated together for one block, so to speak. Or it can be only one transaction basically over a period of time. So new block, and then new nodes, the miners. Remember the previous picture? The miners? The miners are not, not competing 
who is the first one to add the block, to solve the puzzle, to get the reward. If that is going on in that network I showed earlier, this network here, that network. First, computer is going on, and, and then full nodes with, with bigger access to bigger computing power, other miners, and they are competing. And so one of them will win, or will declare that I got it, I got it, other guy said, ah, he got it, or she got it, and, and done with it. So one Bitcoin transaction plus other transactions make a block. Now, so go ahead. Until we solve the puzzle, the time, all the transactions are pending. Pending, yeah. And that's why intentionally the 10 minute lag between blocks being added. So the rate at which the blocks get added is 10 minutes. Basically. And I will come to that either today or tomorrow as well. What are people <coughs> doing to reduce that transaction time? Okay. But right now, for this around 10 minutes, right now. Ether and all other guys have reduced the, the time as well. There are other platforms claiming that they have made it very fast. So you can just wait for that. Right? So if you look at it now, example of proof continued. So step one, new block of the of new block of the Bitcoin transaction and other transaction, new block plus nonce one. Remember nonce, right? New block plus nonce one. You hash you go to the hash function, you will get a hash. Wrong. Because why is wrong? Exactly. I mean, four zeros is my algorithm, my hash function requirement. This is wrong. Step two, then try nonce two now. But you're not trying it. Computer is like a madman. Your machine is doing that for you. Nonce two, three zero, wrong. Step three, many, many zeros. But that has to be designed with how many? Three, three, eight zeros. And that's what they, they say, okay, there are eight zeros. So, okay, success for that kind of algorithm. And then step four, then that thing and nonce, nonce three, because nonce three, if you look at here, right, we have the result we wanted, the puzzle solved here. So, that whole thing is, is a celebration here with champagne glass or white wine glass, sparkling wine. Nonce three gets all this broadcast here. Okay, I, I, I got it, right? And then from there, you get step five, previous blockchain, a new block of transactions, new longer updated blockchain. Now the blockchain L, length L, becomes blockchain length L plus one. This is how the whole thing works, guys. There's no magic, no rocket science. It would be that taken us two days to come to this space. But this is as simple as that. There's no other 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 mystery behind the whole thing. Okay. So in summary, proof of work, norms, mining are key elements in a blockchain. Just remember this. And I don't want to go it through again, but if you can read that, it will be sent the PDF file tonight or tomorrow. You can read that. This is a pictorial representation of what I talked the last five, ten minutes. New block, recent block, header, nonce, a target value, so many zeros, that's called target value, is hash of x, y, z, x, z is this, x is there, y is there, right? If the hash of that at the target value, mining difficulty, so you can you can you can really set the mining difficulty if you want to. That's a target value to achieve by the miners to make their life difficult. And then if it is yes, proof of work, or this is get the reward, call it the day. If not, then another nonce will go back again. So this is the flow chart of, of the whole of the whole thing. And again, you will get a copy of all these things in the email from uh, from Pandey, and then uh, go from there. So now, I talked all the great things about blockchain and all the stuff. There are some problems, okay? And some of the issues are the truth of work, basically, is extremely inefficient. 
in terms of energy consumption. Look at the note there. Bitcoin mining consumes more energy than 159 countries in the world. More 159 countries in the world. Think about it. How difficult the Bitcoin mining is in this case. Very expensive because compute power and energy all stuff. Incentivizes miners to centralize the hashing power. You mentioned earlier, what is your name? Krishna. Krishna mentioned earlier about people colluding, and you talked talk about that too. What is your name? Ananya. Ananya, you talked about that as well. So it incentivizes miners to concentrate the, the, the hashing stuff to themselves because they have access to bigger computers. Or some can collude together and they both have the same effect. So that is not what the, the blockchain people wanted when they invented that. They wanted a decentralized democratic system. When the power gets concentrated in few hands, is it democracy or a communist party rule in China? Who has the answer to that question? So this is a bad thing. Concentrated mining, uh, collusion, all those things. The scalability. If something takes 10 minutes to transact by you to add a block, that's difficult to scale. Right? For our applications, you want to design for school or something else, or for India's land records, you, you can't do that. And so scalability, so sorry, go ahead. But it was a private blockchain, then we can uh, like, uh, change the time at which the blockchain. Sure, you can. But that's what earlier, smiling difficulty. So you can play with the mining difficulty and, and increase the thermometer temperature up or down. Yes, yes, I say yes. But you can do that. The scalability and the speed. They both go hand in hand sometimes because you know uh, you can't scale an application if it takes a you know, long time. So emphasis of newer proof of something is to improve the scalability and the speed of transactions and costs. So there are many newer proof of something uh, required. Then I'll give you some examples of what those new things are. Proof of stake is not same as proof of work. Proof of work was the first one, the, the easy in a way that you tell me that you did the job, you did the work. If I'm convinced, matter closed, you get the reward. So it is simpler from that perspective, but then it takes a time. Proof of stake, by the way, it has some good things, some bad things. I don't want to read everything here, but I want to summarize about what POS is, proof of stake. Proof of stake basically is incentivizes those to have a stake in the system. Now think about it. It has a, a threat of becoming an oligarchy. If I own a stake in the network, you own a stake, there are 10 of us, you own 10%, you own 20%, you own 50%, you own. Then guess what? The most powerful, the more wealthier, will control the whole network. That was not the idea behind blockchain at all. It's supposed to be democratic, decentralized. So proof of stake has that, that drawback, but it does make things a little faster. So some of the issues with POW. It does solve some of the issues there to some extent, not 100% to some extent, but it has its own issues. You don't want to give birth to oligarchy in a so called democratic decentralized network. Okay? And you guys can do your own reading on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the topic because my job is to just you know, expose all of you to some idea. Other thing called proof of authority. So, proof of work. Proof of stake, proof of authority. <clears throat> if you think of Project Viva, I encourage you to Google that, what it is all about. This time is not here today to go through that. And, and proof of authority goes beyond POW and POS. Okay? Again, instant transaction. Remember, someone asked me yesterday, today as well, the speed, speed question. They promised instant transaction. So you don't have to use POW, POS. When you need a trustless consensus, you can use proof of authority. You have instant transaction, speed problem. 
seamless consensus and solves conflict of interest, self versus network. For example, in proof of stake, the self interest was not necessarily the same as the network's interest. Because if I own a stake in the network, then guess what? I will buy it, right? So this one proof of authority does solve, solves conflict of interest, self versus network in a rent in proof of the stake. Because if you own a stake in something, you are buyer. Or you might be buyer. Not you are buyer, you might be buyer, right? So the homework is now for you guys to think about what could be other proofs of something. What can you design your own proof you need? So think about it. And there are not only three, but there are other other 10, 12, 15 um, proofs of something. So you can have your own proof of something depending on how difficult you want to make life from a puzzle point of view. So okay, so where is Anandaji here? So this one I was told that once I can do the video, I want to to so by the slide part is done and I will show you you still have uh, half an hour roughly. I'm going to show you parts of two videos. Uh, one is from the professor from Princeton, and you might hear some of the stuff I talked about already, but you will get added to the idea as well. So let me uh, let me stop my uh, my uh, PC now, and should automatically go to. I've been told to we'll go to uh, the other other uh, machine and play the play the YouTube. So let me take this out. This is what Hope it comes. Can you see? Okay, this is your school system. I don't want to mess it up, right? <laughs> I'll go to the student as well with you guys, okay? Is a real professor by this. The first lecturer is Joseph Deneau. He's a postdoctoral researcher in computer science at Princeton University. The second lecturer is me, Ed Felton. I'm a professor at Princeton in computer science and in the Woodrow Wilson School. The third lecturer is Arvind Narayan. He's a computer science professor at Princeton. And fourth, our special guest lecturer is Andrew Miller. He's a PhD student in computer science at the University of Maryland. There will be 11 lectures in total. In this lecture number one, we're going to do two things. First, we'll introduce some cryptographic primitives that turn out to be necessary for talking about cryptocurrencies. In particular, we'll talk about cryptographic hashes and digital signatures, and we'll talk about some of the ways in which those are used to build cryptocurrencies. And then at the end of the lecture, uh, we'll start talking about cryptocurrencies. Uh, and I'll give some examples of simple cryptocurrencies that illustrate some of the design challenges that we need to deal with. Uh, I want to apologize for covering the cryptographic material at the beginning. Unfortunately, we have to eat some of our vegetables a little bit in order to, let, to lay groundwork for the cryptocurrency stuff. So if you came for the cryptocurrency stuff, let me assure you, first of all, that we will get to it in this lecture. And that having laid the groundwork in this lecture, there's going to be a lot more specifically cryptocurrency-focused material in later lectures. All right, so let's get to it. In segment 1.1, we're going to talk about cryptographic hash functions. We'll talk about what they are and what their properties are. And then later we'll move on and talk about what their applications are. So a cryptographic hash function is a mathematical function. And it has three attributes that we need to start with. First of all, a hash function can take any string as input, absolutely any string of any size. It produces a fixed size output. We'll use 256 bits uh, in this series of lectures because that's what Bitcoin does. And it has to be efficiently computable, meaning given a string, it, in a reasonable length of time, you can figure out what the output is. So that's a hash function. But we're going to need hash functions that are cryptographically secure. Uh, the, the cryptographic properties of hash functions are a complicated topic in general. But we're going to focus here on three particular properties, and I'll explain in a minute what those are. Uh, in 
in particular that the function is collision free, that it has a hiding property, and that it's puzzle friendly. And for each of these, I'll talk about what the property is, what it means, and then I'll talk about why it's useful to have a function that has that property. So first, collision free. So the first property that we need from a cryptographic hash function is that it's collision free. And what that means is that it's impossible, nobody can find values x and y, such that x and y are different, and yet the hash of x is equal to the hash of y. And so if we look at the operation of the function as depicted by one of these red arrows, here's x and h of x, and here's y and h of y, then nobody can find a situation like this, that you have an x and y that are separate, and yet when you hash them, they hash to the same value. Now one thing to notice is that I said nobody can find. I didn't say that there is no collision. Because if you think about it, there has to be a collision. Collisions do exist, and to understand why that is, we can, uh, we can use this diagram. Over here on the left, I'm depicting all of the possible inputs to this function, which can be a string of any size. And over here, I have all of the possible outputs, which has to be a string of 256 bits in size. So the right-hand side here, the outputs, there are only two to the 256 possibilities. Over here, there are more possibilities. And so if you think that every point over here on the left is going to be mapped by an arrow to some point on the right, you can see that as you go from all the points over here on the left into the right, it has to get crowded, and in fact, that there have to be multiple values over here on the left that map to the same output over here. In fact, in general, there will be a very large number of possible inputs that map to any particular output. So collisions do exist. I said before, nobody can find a collision, and that's the key question. We know collisions exist, the question is, are there any collisions that are findable by regular people using regular computers? Okay. Now, to make things even worse, I said that it has to be impossible to find a collision. Let me tell you how to find a collision, because there's a method that's guaranteed to work. And the method works like this, that we're going to take 2 to the 130 randomly chosen inputs over on the left cloud of that previous diagram. And if we pick those 2 to the 130 randomly chosen inputs, uh, it turns out there's a 99.8% chance that at least two of them are going to collide. And so this is a very simple method for finding a collision. Um, it works no matter what the hash function is, but of course the problem is that this takes a very, very long time to do. You have to compute the hash function 2 to the 130 times, and, and that's of course an astronomical number. This method works no matter which hash function we're using. There's still a 99.8% probability that this works, and if it doesn't work, just try it again, and it'll probably work the next time. Hmm. Um, but this doesn't really matter, and the reason it doesn't really matter is that this procedure takes 2 to the 130 steps in order to get to that high probability. So we can say something like this. We can say that if every computer ever made, ever made by humanity was computing since the beginning of the entire universe up to now, the odds that they would have found a collision is still infinitesimally small. So small that it's way less than the odds that the Earth will be destroyed by a giant meteor in the next two seconds, which didn't happen. <laughs> so, um, we know how to find a collision, but this method takes too long to matter. The question is, is there some other method that could be used on a particular hash function in order to find a collision? Uh, and that's the question that is harder to, uh, to answer. Is there a faster way to find collisions? Well, for some possible values of hash functions, of course there are. For example, if our hash function were to uh, simply take the input modulo 2 to the 256, that is, it just selected the last 256 bits of the input, uh, then we would know an easy way to find a collision. Uh, one collision would be the values 3 and 3 plus 2 to the 256. So for some possible values of the hash function, uh, it's very easy to find a collision. For others, we don't know. Now one thing I need to, to note is that there's no hash function in existence which has been proven to be collision-free. There are just some that people have tried really, really hard to find collisions and haven't succeeded. And so we choose to believe that uh, those are collision-free. Okay. Now, what good does collision freedom do us? If we can assume that we have a hash function that is collision-free, then we can use that hash function as a message digest. And what I mean by that is the following, that if we know that x and y have the same hash, then it's safe to assume that x and y are different. Because if someone knew an x and y that were different that had the same hash, of course that would be a collision. Since there's not a collision that we know of, uh, then uh, knowing the hashes are the same, we can assume that the values are the same. And this lets us use the hash as a kind of message digest. 
Suppose, for example, that we had a file, a really big file, and we wanted to be able to recognize later whether another file was the same as the file we saw the first time. Right? So one way to do that would be to save the whole big file, and then when we saw another file later, just compare them. But because we have hashes that we believe are collision-free, it's more efficient to just remember the hash of the original file. Then if someone shows us a new file and claims that it's the same, we can compute the hash of that new file and compare the hashes. If the hashes are the same, then we conclude that the files must have been the same. Uh, and that gives us a very efficient way to remember things we've seen before and recognize them again. Um, and of course, this is useful because the hash is small. It's only two, 256 bits, while the original file might be really big. So hash is useful as a message digest, and we'll see later on in this lecture and in subsequent lectures why it's useful to use hash as a message digest. So the second property that we want from our hash function is that it's hiding. And the property that we want is something like this, that if we're given the output of the hash function, that there's no feasible way to figure out what the input x was. The problem is that this property doesn't exactly hold. Uh, and to understand why that's the case, let's look at this example. So here, what we're going to do is an experiment where we flip a coin, and if the result of the coin flip was heads, we're going to return the hash of the string heads, and if the result was tails, we're going to return the hash of the string tails. Uh, and now we're going to ask someone who didn't see the coin flip but only saw this hash output to figure out what the string was that was hashed. That, of course, is going to be easy. It's easy in this scenario uh, to find what the input string was. It's easy to find x. You simply compute the hash of the string heads and the hash of the string tails, and you see which one you got. Uh, and so in just a couple of steps, you can figure out what x was. So the reason this example failed, that is the reason why uh, an adversary was able to guess what the string was, was that there were uh, only a couple of possible values of x. And so, if we're going to have a, pro a hiding property like this, it needs to be the case that there's no value of, of x which is particularly likely. That is, all the eight, x has to be chosen from a set that's in some sense very spread out. So that this method for the adversary of just trying all the possible values of x, or just trying a few values of x that are especially likely, is not going to work. So the hiding property that we are going to need to set up is a little bit more complicated. Uh, and the way we're going to fix this problem with the common value x, like heads and tails, is we're going to take the x and we're going to put next to it, we're going to concatenate with it, with it a value r, which is chosen from a distribution that's really spread out. Um, and so uh, this h of r concatenated with x, that means take all the bits of r and put after them all the bits of x. Uh, and so what we're going to say is, given the hash of r together with x, that it's infeasible to find x, and that this will be true in the formally stated property that if r is a random value chosen from a distribution that has high mean entropy, then given the hash of r concatenated with x, it's infeasible to find x. And what does high mean entropy mean? Well, it captures this intuitive idea that r is chosen from a distribution that's really spread out. And what that means specifically is that there's no particular value that r could have had that would occur with more than a negligible probability. So for example, if r is chosen uniformly from among all of the strings that are 256 bits long, then any particular string was chosen with probability 1 in 2 to the 256, which is truly a negligible value. So as long as r was chosen that way, then the hash of r concatenated with x is going to hide x. And that's the hiding property that the hash function would be deemed to have. OK, now let's look at an application of that hiding property. And in particular, what we want to do is something called a commitment. And this is kind of the digital analogy of taking a value, a number, and sealing it in an envelope and putting that envelope out on the table where everyone can see it. Now, when you do that, you've committed to what's in the envelope, but you haven't opened it. It's secret from everyone else. Later, you can open the envelope and get out the value, but it's sealed. So commit to a value and reveal it later. We want to do that in a digital sense. So to be more specific about what is the API that we're going to provide here, um, the commitment API looks like this, that there are two things you can do. First, you can commit to a message, and that's going to return two values, a commitment and a key. Think of the commitment as the envelope that you're going to put on the table, and the key as a secret key for unlocking the envelope. Then later, um, you allow someone else to verify, given a commitment and given a key, which you've told them in the meantime, in the message, they can verify that that commitment 
key and message really do go together, and this will return a true or false. Okay, now to seal MSG in an envelope, what we do is we commit uh, to the message, and that returns uh, a commitment and a key, and then we publish the commitment. That's putting the envelope on the table. Now later, to open the envelope, what we're going to do is publish the key and the message that we committed to, um, and then anybody can use this verify call with the commitment that we published previously, the key and message that we just announced, to check the validity uh, of, of, of our opening the envelope. Um, and the property, of course, we want from this is that it behaves like sealing an envelope. And in particular, the two security properties are these. First, given COM, the commitment, the envelope on the table, that someone just looking at the envelope can't figure out what the message is. The second property is that it's binding, that when you commit to what's in the envelope, you can't change your mind later. That is, it's infeasible to find two different messages such that you can commit to one message and then later claim that you committed to another and the whole thing will verify. Okay, so how do we know that these two properties hold? Well, first we need to talk about uh, how we're going to actually implement commitments. Uh, and the way we're going to implement commitments is like this. Um, that in order to commit to a value message, uh, we're going to uh, generate a random 256 value, bit value and call it the key. And then we're going to, as the commitment, return the hash of the key uh, concatenated together with the message. And as, uh, uh, and, and as the key value, we're going to return h of this, of this, of this key, and then later to verify, um, someone is going to um, compute this same hash of the key they were given, concatenated with the message, and um, they're going to check whether that's equal to the commitment that they saw. Okay, so this is a way of using hash functions both in the commitment and in the verification. So now the security properties, if we go down to the security properties that were at the bottom of the previous slide, and we just plug in the definitions. Of, 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 of how we're going to implement this here. That is, uh, this used to say com, given com, infeasible to find message. We just plug in what com is. Com is the hash of t concatenated with message. And similarly down here, uh, this is what happens when we take what was written there before and plug in the definition of verify in com. Okay, so now what these properties become, the first one is given h of key concatenated with message, it's infeasible to find message. Well, it turns out that that's exactly the, the hiding property that we talked about before. Key was chosen as a two, random 256-bit value, um, and therefore um, the, the hiding property says that if we take the message and we put before it something that was chosen from a very spread out distribution, like I said, a random 256-bit value, then it's infeasible to find the message. So this is exactly the hiding property. And this one down here turns out to be exactly the, uh, the collision-free property. So that if someone can find two messages which have the same hash like this, well then they have an input value here and an input value there that are different, and yet those have the same hash. And so because of the two security properties we've talked about for hashes so far, uh, this commitment scheme will work in the sense that it will have the necessary security properties. Okay, so that's the second security property of hashes, that they're hiding and the application of that is commitments. The third security property we're going to need is that they're puzzle friendly. And this is, again, a little bit more complicated, but let me just go through it a bit by bit. That for any possible output value y that you might want from the hash function, we're going to use y as an output value of the hash function. That if k is chosen from a distribution that has high main entropy, that is k is chosen randomly from some set that's super spread out, then there's no way to find an x such that the hash of k and x is equal to y. So what this means is basically that if someone wants to target the hash function, if they want it to come out to some particular output value y, that if there's part of the input that is chosen in a suitably uh, randomized way, that it's very difficult to find another value that hits exactly that target. So the application we're going to use of this is uh, we're going to build a search puzzle. And what that means is we're going to uh, build a mathematical problem uh, which requires searching a very large space in order to find the solution, uh, and where there's no shortcuts the way to find a, uh, a good solution other than searching that large space. So at this point, uh, we'll move to the second video. Uh, just want to give you guys a, a, a flavor of how a professor or a academic academician will talk about those things. So you've heard the three properties of the hash function. And I talked about it earlier as well. And it can become really complicated, by the way, from an academic point of view. 
So I want to stop that one and I want to show some parts of the next 10 minutes. Uh, another video, this is from Berkeley. The first one was from Princeton University. This one from uh, Berkeley. And uh, after 10 minutes, we will stop that as well. Uh, another part is we will have uh, the links of all those YouTube URL links. So in the email, we will send you the PDF file. We will send the links as well. And I will encourage you to, to listen to them, watch the videos. Uh, they will give you a different flavor of, uh, of what is behind this whole thing called blockchain. Thank you very much and please help. Consensus mechanisms. <laughs> so these are ways to achieve what proof of work does, which is achieving consensus without necessarily doing it the way that proof of work likes to do it. So we're going to go over um, a few different topics. First, we'll introduce distributed systems, what they are in general, so that you have a better idea of what needs to happen in a distributed system. We'll then go over proofs of something else, which are proof of work like algorithms. Um, that they expend some resource to cast the votes. We'll go over proof of stake a little more, talking about the particular implementations that are popular. Then Rusty will continue with voting-based consensus algorithms and federated consensus. So first, distributed systems. The question is, what are the what does it mean when you talk about a distributed system? The definition varies from person to person, but the consensus between people is that it involves a network of independent nodes, each representing some process which talk to each other via messages. So in the system, every node is its own process, meaning that it can, does its own computations, it does its own activities, and it shares information between these other processes via messages. And the properties of shared systems, as you can imagine, are that you have concurrent components, and things are working side by side, they're not necessarily working one at a time because you have things that are not relying on each other. You have message sharing, which means that if you have drop messages or an inability to send messages, then you'll have partitions. You have no global clock, meaning that you can't rely on time, which means that you want to ensure, for the most part, that you have an asynchronous environment so that you don't have to rely on any one process's message or any one process's completion of some computation. And you can expect that there's going to be failures of some individual components of a distributed system. That's inevitable with any, with any machine. That one machine might fail. The thing you want to keep in mind is that you never want the system to go down because one machine is failed. So there's two ways to prove the correctness of a distributed system. That's by proving that it satisfies two different properties. These properties are safety and liveness. Safety properties are what a system should never do, and liveness properties are what a system should do. So it's natural. You say what something should do and what it shouldn't do. Here's why you want to ensure that something um, always has safety, because let's say that something is completely live, that means it's always doing something. If it's always returning some value, it's meaningless if it returns every value that appears, which could include incorrect values. Right? So having a system that's only dedicated to liveness is a trivial system and meaningless. So if you go to the other extreme, where you have only safety, the system never returns any false value. You say it never returns any value at all. We satisfy safety, but now it doesn't tell us any information about the system, which means that it's meaningless as well. It's trivial. So the key is finding a way to balance these two properties such that you can achieve one while also not sacrificing the other. And every distributed system needs to come to consensus on the values that it stores. Right? So the correctness of a distributed system is achieving its intended goal, which in our case is coming to consensus on some lot of information. To ensure correctness, one uses a consensus algorithm to achieve all three of these following things. Validity, agreement, and termination. In other words, when these nodes come to consensus, they need to come to consensus on a valid value meaning a value that's proposed by one of the processes, they need to all come to consensus on this value. If, uh, if they come to consensus on a value, all the non-faulty processes have to come to consensus on the same value, meaning that you shouldn't have one set of nodes come to agreements on one value, another on another value, and then you have, discrepant, you have a lack of consensus in the system, which is not achieving the intended goal. You see that agreements is a safety property 
because it means that this bad thing will never happen, that honest nodes will never side on different values. Keep in mind we're focusing on non-faulty nodes or on honest nodes because we don't care what faulty nodes do as long as it doesn't interrupt the consensus process. If a faulty node chooses to always just move the honest nodes, it's fine, he can do that as long as we can recognize what the honest values are. And finally, termination, which means that all non-faulty nodes will eventually decide on some value. And this is a Leibniz property. We want nodes to eventually decide on some value because if they never decide on value, yes, they satisfy the safety property of never coming to consensus on different values, but then they never come to agreements on any value. And that is a huge issue because then we can't do anything with our system. Any questions so far? So the cap theorem is a fundamental theorem for any distributed system, which talks about what a distributed system is able to achieve. There's these three categories of things that one can achieve with a distributed with a distributed system. So no, you can you can watch the video uh, with the deep end now, uh, highly highly professorial and highly uh, academic. Nothing wrong with that, by the way. But for our purposes, for this course, short course. I think I will, I will pause there and uh, I will open up the next five minutes. Any other comments, any questions on today's topic? <laughs>